Good morning, church. Good morning. How's everybody doing this morning? Good. There we go. All right. Well, if you are joining us online, please give us a shout out in the comments. Let us know you're here so um, we can just relish in the fact that you are with us. We thank you to everyone that's here with us in person. It is not the nicest day out there. <coughs> As many of you know, and you could probably see online, um, we've made it the fireside room again. <laughs> Bring out the heater and warm it up just a little bit. A little bit quicker. I think it was 64 when I pulled that out, and it's now up to 70, and you're nice and toasty. So don't worry about it getting cold. All right. Well, this Wednesday, this is the first day of the bar, our week, and it's a busy week at that. Wednesday, well, today is worship, obviously. We're going to be having a, a wonderful message that is based on the next uh, episode in season three. Can you believe it? We're going to be, after this all gives the halfway point of season three. And uh, so this Wednesday night, we'll be watching the second episode of a two part episode called Clean. And the message this morning that Pastor Mark is preaching is going to be called Commissioned. And it's about the disciples coming and going out two by two. But in this next episode, Eden still continues to struggle with Simon and Simon with Eden as they, dis as they have trouble uh, talking and struggling to understand one another after he comes back from the missionary trip that Jesus had sent them on. And with tensions mounting there at home, Simon pours himself into fixing the city's water problem with his new friend Gaius. And for those of you that saw the episode Wednesday night, we see Gaius and Simon having a heart-to-heart -heart at the broken cistern. <laughs> Who knew that those two would come together? But meanwhile, we also um, were reintroduced to Jairus and his family, as well as Veronica. And they are equally desperate to find Jesus in this next episode as their only hope for the crises that they are in. And it's interesting, we are going to be watching the next episode, and I'm getting ahead of myself with the Narnia series, but we, we <coughs> Diane and I rewatched Cas Prince Caspian last night, and it truly is, it fits this episode very well because it talks about, uh, or we see the kings and queens of Narnia, the children, as they try to push through on their own without Aslan. Kind of like the way we like to push through life without God and forgetting that we need to go to him first. So if you haven't uh, been able to catch up with the series, you can do that very easily. Go out to our website, uh, gracetree.church uh, slash the hyphen chosen. Um, it's also under, if you click on grow, there's a drop down, click on chosen, and it gives you the options of how to watch. Uh, there's links to the app stores for both Apple and Android. We are not partial to either one. Well, a couple of us might be, but I digress. And there's also a link to watch it online. Um, each week in, the, in our uh, church chat, uh, over the last couple of weeks, I've been sending that out so people can obviously be able to watch that as well on angel.com. And then, then Saturday. Thank you. Now, last week, Mark, I don't, I don't know if you heard the announcements last week, but Doug offered to cook bacon, and I mentioned maybe getting like the already cooked bacon and just warming it up. And that's what he did last week. He offered to cook bacon from the raw state. So I was saying about picking up a package of bacon so he could cook that up for us. But to go with the eggs, and, and uh, this is my favorite part, the salt, because I like salt. But... Uh, we'll be having our men's breakfast, a time of faith, food, and fellowship, coming together with other men of God, and just having a time where we can uh, spend time together, sharpen iron, sharpen, as the proverb tells us, and we'll also have a devotional uh, that as well. Then that evening, and Saturday is the busiest day of the week, all right? So Saturday evening, at 5.30, the doors will be opening. At 6 o'clock, we will be showing the Chronicles of Narnia, the Voyage of the Dawn Treader. And if you remember the Prince Caspian movie, only two of the kids returned because the other two had learned everything they needed to while in Narnia. And in this one, uh, they're visiting their annoying cousin, Eustace. And Lucy and Edmund uh, come across a painting of a majestic ship called the Don Treader. 
Suddenly, the painting comes to life and draws the youths into Narnia, where they meet their old friend, King Caspian. And Caspian is on a quest to find the seven lost lords of Telmar, whose swords will save Narnia from an evil green mist that enslaves men's men, from men's minds and bodies. And you can find out more about that at Grace Street Life Church, and just click the Grace Street Cinema link in the upper right-hand corner. And yes, Reapy Cheat is in this one as well. Um, and then, here's the last part of Saturday, or this Sunday morning, but before you, you get home from the movie, just immediately go to all your clocks, if you hadn't already before you left, and turn them back an hour, or you're going to be early for church. Not that being early for church is a bad thing, but you will be early for church. So uh, just remember to fall back and that uh, we get that extra hour of sleep. And then the following Saturday is, it's not as busy, but it's going to be really busy and busier than normal. Uh, we will be having our November monthly races along with the season finales, which includes uh, car of the year running. That's a double elimination. So that will take us a little time. More about that at orangetrackracing.org. And then also in the uh, comments, Mark will be posting up a link to today's worship music. So if you are watching from home, please feel free to click on that and worship with the music that's there. And also you can catch up with the trailer to the movie. That was a lot. I'm, I'm just gonna, I think I might just camp out over here. It's nice and warm. You guys got the best seats in the house. The warmth coming off of that. You don't need to do that. <laughs> we can turn it down. Um, but for this morning's call to worship, Pastor Mark has chosen Mark 6, verses 7 through 13. <coughs> Hear this from the Apostle Mark. It says, And he called the twelve to himself and began to send them out two by two, and gave them power over unclean spirits. He commanded them to take nothing for the journey except a staff, no bag, no bread, no copper in their money belts, but to wear sandals and not to put on two tunics. Also he said to them, in whatever place you enter a house, stay there till you depart from that place, and whoever will not receive you nor hear you, when you depart from there, shake the dust under your feet as a testimony against them. Assuredly, I say to you, it will be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. So they went out and preached that people should repent. And they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. If you have not watched this most recent episode, the very beginning, I, I, I just go out and watch it. You know, we as kids, I talked about this Wednesday. As kids, we wa I watched TV in black and white, and it's like, oh, I want to watch color. There was something profoundly impactful about seeing this in black and white, and all you hear is like muttering tones or voices. You don't hear words, but you you're seeing people healed, and you're seeing demons cast out, and people coming in. It all culminates at the end of that scene with the disciples all teaching the people the Lord's Prayer. Now, they could have covered a lot more ground if they'd have gone out one by one. But Jesus had a plan. And he, this was a plan that would help them to strengthen one another, to comfort themselves in rejection. I don't know about you, I don't do rejection well. But you had, you, you had somebody with you. I have, as a partner in ministry, I have Mark. As a partner in life, I have Diane. We get through these things together. And they were able to discern against any possible mistakes and to stave off idleness or indifference because, you know, I know I have to prompt people in my life to do things and they have to prompt me. So we get our strength, though, from God. And he meets our needs through teamwork. Now, when he said take nothing with them, all I could think of was frog. <clears throat> Some of you are looking at me like, what? Frog, fully rely on God. They had to put everything they had in God because they
they didn't take those extra things with them. And then shaking the dust from their feet just meant separating themselves. It was a Jewish thing uh, in that time that when they went through an area that was inhabited by the Gentiles or even the Samaritans, that they would shake the dust from their feet as a way of separating themselves from those people. So he's saying separate yourselves from those who don't want to hear. And just like them, for us, we're responsible for presenting the good news carefully and faithfully. And when it's presented that way, we're not to blame when it's rejected. Father God, as we prepare to hear this message, this message called Commission from Pastor Mark, we just thank you. We thank you that you have given us this series to really expand on your scriptures. We thank you that we can learn from this how you want us to go. We each, just as the disciples, as your followers, are commissioned to go out to share your love to share your grace, your mercy, and your forgiveness. Father, in this ever-darkening world, Father, we just ask that there would be a repentance across our country and across this world and a return to you, Father. In Jesus' name. Good morning, church. How's everybody today? Good. Bright, shining faces. A few yawns going on out here, I see. Um, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. We have a lot of things to be glad about in here. And in this uh, message that we have today, and we're, we're talking about The Chosen, uh, this episode of The Chosen happens to be a two-part episode, so you're going to get kind of a, a double whammy out of this thing. But as we uh, progress through this series in here, hopefully it's touching your heart. And uh, in this one here, they've got a few themes that I'm going to touch on today as we go through the message. Uh, but first, I want to talk about commission. So commission, what does that mean to you? Well, if you're in the military, commission has a whole separate meaning than if you're in the church. Commission means you've gone through the commissioning process, you're an officer, and you have a status level above everybody, and, and uh, a non-commissioned officer can only rise up so high in the military, and uh, so th there's some different things you have to look at. But in the church, to be commissioned in our context here means that we are anointed, ordained, and sent out. So as we talk about that, we, we heard about the apostles. They're called apostles because the word apostle means they are being sent or sent out. And they are out there to do a mission for the church. So typically in a church, when someone enters into service for the church, then they typically go through what is called a commissioning service to do the work of the church. And this is what Jesus was doing for the disciples. And if we watched that, I, I loved it because, uh, you know, when Lori came to my graduation, when, when I went through and we were commissioned to go out when we graduated uh, by the Iowa Annual Conference of the United Methodist Church. And so it was a big deal up in Des Moines and we all come across the stage and everything and they had a whole day's worth of activities for us and all these kind of things. But the commissioning was, we were commissioned to go out and do God's work and to do it uh, under the guise of the United Methodist Church. Um, but when Jesus did this, it was really funny, and, and they were all sitting around the table, and they were going, you gave us all these powers, but we, I don't feel any different. What's going on? Shouldn't there be like a ceremony? <laughs> I love it. He goes, yeah, this is it. <laughs> so it was something else, and the commissioning doesn't have to be this huge thing. The anointing or ordination by God doesn't have to be a good thing or big thing. It's a good thing instead. I kind of twisted my words a bit there. But it's a good thing because what it does is it sets us up and empowers us to go out and do the work of God. He anoints us, he empowers us, and he ordains us to go out and do his good works. That's where I was going with that. So we are to go out and spread the good news of salvation 
and do good works in the name of God. When he commissioned the disciples, they took on the title of apostle then because they were being sent out in all the different directions. And that means that they were going out two by two so that they could minister together. No one person has all the strengths. And again, if you notice, we all have different talents. We don't all look the same. We don't speak the same. So each one of those, he paired up to go out and do a special purpose based on the gifts that they had. And I thought that was pretty special that they really touched on that. So when our call to worship this morning, we heard about them being sent out two by two. But he had very explicit instructions for them. Take nothing with you. Take nothing with you. No money. No coins in your purse. No food. No change of clothes. No nothing. That's a tall order, but it was a necessary. So, you know, I just returned from a trip last week, and I took all kinds of stuff with me. You know, it's necessary to do the work that I had to do. I took tools and test equipment, and I, of course, I took clothes. And yes, dear, I did take an extra pair of underwear. I learned that lesson early on in life, you know, just in case. But he told the apostles not even to take an extra tunic with them. Not even an extra tunic. See, the apostles needed to take along faith. That is what he really, really wanted them to take. Faith in God. A reliance on God to provide for them what they needed. Not to, what? Rely on themselves, but to rely fully on God. Or as Terry said, frog it. They got a frog it out there. No, they didn't go hopping around. But they needed to fully rely on God. A reliance on God provided for them then what they needed. And that was the only tool necessary for them to carry out the mission that they had at hand. So this was to be a life-changing experience for them. And it was to set the stage then for them for the rest of their lives on going out and doing their ministry. Because they knew that no matter what they had, they had enough to go and do what God needed them to do. Now, do we do that same thing? Do we fully rely on God? Do we take our faith into action and step out in faith? Or do we always kind of fall back on, well, I don't think I'm really prepared. I don't know all the rules. I don't know all the answers. I don't know all the things. So I can't really go out and do the work of God. See, that's relying on yourself and not. We can talk ourselves out of just about anything at any given point in time, right? Right. right. So how do you prepare for a journey? How do you prepare for a journey? What do you take with you? You take what is necessary for you to have a successful journey, right? You plan it out ahead of time and you go and do these things. So now to be fair, he did equip them with certain tools to do the mission. He gave them powers, and not just any powers, but he, he gave them powers to teach and to preach. And Terry and I will both tell you, it takes a lot sometimes to get up and preach and teach. It really does. It's not just show up on Sunday morning and, and talk about things. It takes a lot of preparation to go in there. Lori knows. I shut her out and everything else out while I take care of getting the mist. But he gave them powers to teach and to preach. He gave them very special tools, powers to heal, powers to cast out demons and to anoint with oils to purify those people as they went through and spread that good news. See, the good news wasn't just simply words, but it was good works as well in the name of Jesus. So sometimes, and do good works, and you can spread the word of Jesus, and you can spread the good news, you don't have to say a thing. But you prove it through your actions towards others. Now, none of these things on their own were of their own accord, but they had the power to do all of these things in the name of Jesus. And usually a question will pop up about teaching on these things at this point in time. Do we as Christians have those same powers as well? to go out and heal 
and go out and cast out demons? And the answer, short answer to that is yes. Yes, it is. The very short answer is yes. But see, there's a lot more to it than just simply yes. Jesus gave delegated authority to his apostles and disciples, as we'll see later on. Several passages illustrate these abilities, such as casting out the demons, healing and performing miracles in Jesus' name. And before returning to heaven, Jesus commanded them to make disciples of all nations. We find that in Matthew. Go out and make disciples of all nations, teaching them what they have learned from him. So, naturally, this includes learning how to apply Jesus' authority in demonic warfare. See, he commissioned not just the apostles, but he commissioned all disciples, making them disciples in their name. As that disciples, we get that delegated authority. As disciples ourselves, we get that delegated authority. He commissioned them to do the works through the name of Jesus. You can't do it on your own accord. You can't do it by yourself. But in the name of Jesus, he will anoint us. He will empower us. So not by might, but by God's spirit. Righteous living, knowledge of scriptures, and faith in Christ equip us to fight the enemy out there, to fight those very battles. Utmost humility is necessary when we invoke this authority. It isn't to be taken lightly. And note, I want to say this note right now. Faith must be strong and well-grounded before going down this path. It is not for beginners. It is not something to be taken lightly. If you're gonna go into spiritual warfare, trust me, it can get very hot, very heavy, very quickly. Been there, done that. On a lighter note, if a person has some sort of possession, I like that vehicle right there. <laughs> if a person has some sort of possession leading them to Christ and having them accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior and being baptized by the water and the Spirit will cleanse them when they are saved. And as the scripture tells us in 2 Corinthians 5.17, for God caused Christ, who himself knew nothing of sin, actually to be sin for our sakes, so that in Christ we might be made good with the goodness of God. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. The old things have passed away. Behold, all things are made new. As we continue then on several of the themes that we have associated with this episode and the next one, these themes are developed then as we go through this episode in The Chosen. So these things that we're talking about in here are played out. You can see them played out. But even if a person is possessed or they, they have some kind of uh, malady that is caused by a spiritual warfare, as they accept Christ and as they are baptized and they are made clean through the Spirit and with water, then it tells us that they are made a new creation and see that old is gone. That old is gone. So if you help lead that person to Christ and they accept Christ as their Savior, then by Christ's power, through the baptism of the Holy Spirit and water, those people are clean. So I want to talk to you about unclean today a little bit. And unclean in here, we talk about the woman, probably one of the first things we, we think about when we come into that is that woman in Mark, in Mark uh, 5, 25 and 26. Now a certain woman had a flow of blood for 12 years and had suffered many things from many physicians. She had spent all that she had and was no better but rather grew worse. Now, if you really want to see something fun, read that verse in Mark, and then turn right around and read it in Luke. Luke, being the physician, had a slightly different take on, on the physician part of things in there, and I thought it was kind of comical to see what Mark wrote and what, what Luke had wrote in there. So, you know, uh, check it out. I think you'll find it fun. So this woman who had been unclean for 12 years, according to the law of Moses, in Leviticus 25, we can, if you want to go through that, you can talk about all of the different things in the purification process and what they had to do to make themselves clean. So she had been unclean for 12 years, according to the law. According to the law, I keep 
hunting safe according to the law. So everybody understands that. The Chosen portrays her as living in Caesarea Philippi, which is a Roman city about an hour's drive north of Capernaum. And presumably, it portrays her as living there because of the challenge that she would have had living in the primary Jewish community at the time. So she went to live in a Roman community because, see, as a Roman, then she wouldn't have to fight all the battles of the Jewish law and everything like that. So it was predominantly a Roman community. So she went there because she was ritually unclean. And so she could have some semblance of life instead of being looked upon, looked down upon and being scorned. So no matter where she slept, no matter where she sat down, and anyone who even touches the things that she touched were themselves then ritually unclean according to Leviticus 25. And then they had to go through a purification process themselves. So Mark 5, 25 through 29 and Luke 8, 43 tells us this story. And like I said, they each have a little bit different take on things. And she was ritually and ceremoniously unclean according to Levitical law. But what we really need to understand that this means that unclean, as it is in those days, does not necessarily mean sinful. Okay? And a lot of people hear that term unclean and they automatically think, well, this person is sinful. And they, or someone in their nature has sinned because if we go back through all the nice Jewish customs and laws, it kind of translated itself down into the same thing. But it's really truly different. Uh, it can be the same thing, but it, most of the time it's not. It's a reminder of the prevalence and unavoidability of sin being deemed unclean. And generally speaking, things are, are deemed to be unclean in the Old Testament ceremonial law are things that could result in sickness or were in some way potentially unhealthy. So one of the reasons for all of the, the laws in the Levitical process and where they said unclean is, was to keep and prevent the spread of diseases back in the day. So you had a ritual process to go through and clean yourself to make sure that you and those around you, that disease would not spread. So it was kind of a way to keep the community as a whole from being sick or, or affected. So in a lot of the cases, it was a way to keep people healthy. I want you to think about that, kind of keep that thought popping around in your head. It was a way to keep the people healthy was to uphold the law. To follow the law. Hello, stereo. So Jesus himself would have been considered ceremoniously unclean because he had touched lepers and people like that. But of course, he never sinned, so he wasn't sinful in the process. So there is a big difference between being this thing's me crazy. between being unclean and being sinful in nature. And I wanted to make sure that we made that distinction so you could understand that. So being ceremoniously unclean, imagine your life for 12 years straight being unclean, rejected by all of your friends, rejected by your family, segregated, set apart, separated from everyone. Can you imagine having to go through that for 12 years? What a terrible thing to try and have to live life that way. But how would your life be different if you could have no interaction with any of your family members? You couldn't have any employment. You couldn't earn a living. No interaction with people. No participation in worship. No going to the market. How about that? What are you going to do for food? So you had to forage on your own. You couldn't go to a public watering hole and draw water from the well because then it would have made the well unclean. Twelve years of having to live this way. This woman was living a life in isolation, cut off from others, and even the strongest of ourselves would lose ourselves in that. Lose our self-worth, lose our hope, lose our dignity. Can you imagine? 
imagine having to live life like that. This woman was suffering every day and every way possible. So then in the episode, and here we see Eden asks, so what do you do with no hope? And the woman named Veronica says, I haven't lost all hope. There might be something I haven't done yet. And when I heard that, I went, wow. Can you imagine what optimism that woman must have had to have had after 12 years of being scorned and separated, set apart from everybody, to have the optimism that, that there might be something that she hadn't done yet. And so there was still hope. See, she hadn't lost all hope. So is there a situation that you've been dealing with or that you have dealt with that might have brought you to that place of no hope? I got a question. How does Veronica's hope speak to you? You ever feel like you're just so far beaten down that there's no hope? No going on? No tomorrow? I've been there quite a while back. It was an ugly place to be. It was a really ugly place to be. I know Terry's been there too because he and I kind of went through the same thing. When our ex-wives took off with our kids and we didn't know where they went. They didn't go together. These were two separate incidents. <laughs> I had no idea where my kids were. Didn't know if I was going to see them again. Wouldn't say where she went. No idea. It's a hopeless feeling, a hopeless situation. If you suffered for 12 years living an isolated life, what would you be thinking? Now, I want to talk about that a little bit here. A lot of us would not look on the bright side of things. We wouldn't look for that glimmer of hope out there that says there might be something that I haven't done yet. We usually kind of wallow down in it, sit down in it, a little pity party, have our pool filled with the pity party. Come on in, the water's warm, join with me in the pity party, in the pool. So back in the day, Eusebius, who was the church leader in 300 AD, actually is the first one to name that woman Veronica. And it says that she was from Caesarea Philippi, and that's where that chosen then gets the background for her. However, Eusebius also says that Veronica was a Gentile, not Jewish. And so therefore, she couldn't have been unclean at the time. There's no biblical evidence one way or the other for this, and so the Chosen chose to portray her as Jewish, using it as an opportunity to teach about being unclean. So people could understand what that meant for people in the society. And that's what I was trying to let you in on this morning was giving you that little glimpse. I think it's important to note there's a big difference between being unclean and being sinful. Either they or someone in their lineage had sinned and that's what caused them to have the malady that they had. Even birth defects, maladies, they suffered for several years. Being unclean didn't signify sin necessarily, but that there needed to be a ritual cleaning done by that person. So think about living life through those times. And, and if we think that we're living in a bad situation right now, think about someone who had to live through those kind of things. A simple birth defect, and they call them unclean and a sinner and reject them in society. And that permanently followed them for their whole lives. Jesus came to save people from being the lost and the least, the lost in society being outcast from society. And we saw in the episode uh, two where he healed the man with the bad hand, the malady in his hand. Do you think that was life-changing for the man in more ways than one? Absolutely. Because it took him out of that stigma of being unclean or being a sinner or being rejected by society. So it takes faith in order for a person to go through all these things. And I want to talk about faith in the midst of confusion. In this episode, we learn more about 
Jairus. And Jairus was the synagogue leader in Capernaum. And if you notice the intertwining of the stories in Mark and in the Gospels in here when it talks about Jairus. Jairus, if you look in the episodes in here, he was the keeper of the records in the synagogue. And in Mark 5, 22 and 23, it says, And behold, one of the rulers of the synagogue came, Jairus by name. And when he saw him, he fell at his feet and begged him earnestly, saying, My little daughter lies at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be healed, and she will live. So Jesus went with him, and a great multitude followed him and thronged him. Do you know what this meant? See, we see here that Jairus is a Jewish leader who reports directly to the Sanhedrin. The leaders, the Jewish council, he reports directly to them. Who are the ones who were trying to keep Jesus pushed down? Who said that he was nothing more than a rogue preacher? See, he had the task of funneling communications to and from the rabbis in the field to the Sanhedrin for that district and for archiving the document collections and for serving as a liaison between the local synagogue and the temple in Jerusalem. It was a very important position to be held and it was one that kept him in the know of everything that was happening throughout the area. As such, you can imagine he knew about Jesus. And when he reportedly had been doing all of these signs and wonders, it had to fly in the face of his experience in dealing with the Jewish state, the rabbinical state that was there. And he had to go through his daily job and read all these reports and file the reports and then send them up to the Sanhedrin so they knew. And we've seen some of these things in the episodes as we've gone through here in The Chosen. So he knew about Jesus. He knew about the signs and wonders. He knew about the healings that Jesus could and would perform. So, one would surmise that it placed him in a precarious position at times. Then his daughter fell ill and it was in a bad way. Now what we have to understand is there were no hospitals per se to take her to. No imaging equipment, no labs. Usually there was a local physician who trained at the medical sciences of the day, herbology, those kind of things. Luke was one of those physicians, by the way. That's why he's a little different take on these. So not really any place he could take his daughter but with all that he had heard about Jesus, he felt that this was his best hope. This was her best hope to get through life. Now we need to understand his position in the church is in jeopardy because he was going to someone outside of the rabbis and outside of the Jewish church, outside of that community for healing. And it had to be a really tough decision for him to make. So it would take a measure of faith in Jesus to have him go and plead at his feet for help for his daughter. All of us as parents know the measures we would go through for our children. There would be very little to stand in the way of us getting the help that we needed to secure for the health and protection of our family at any given point in time. But see, this could end his very livelihood because as soon as the Sanhedrin heard that he went to Jesus for healing, it probably meant that his job was over, his future was over, his life as he knew it was over. He had a lot at stake, but it took a measure of faith for him to do that. It took a measure of faith. So at the same time as all this is going on, we have the rabbis in the areas out there who were coming against Jesus and trying to find evidence against him. And so the second theme that I'd like you to think about in these next couple of episodes is one of called treachery and betrayal. And as we see again, Rabbi Shmuel is back on his mission to rid them of Jesus and the threat that he poses to the rabbinical order of the day. The Chosen imagines him going before the Sanhedrin, the ruling council of the Jews, 
and we saw it in episode two where he had enlisted the help and they were trying to get a political fight going on within the Sanhedrin. A control. A lot of politics involved. Can you imagine one side fighting the other? We, we never hear about that today, do we? Daily. <laughs> So he had enlisted the help of a high priest to hopefully pass a law to end Jesus' ministry once and for all. In the process, they pass instead an edict, and they condemn anyone who claims to claim the title of the Son of Man for themselves. And this comes from Daniel 7, 13 and 14. I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven, he came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him before him. Then to him was given a dominion, authority, glory, and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom the one which shall not be destroyed. See, this is an eternal kingdom. It's a foretelling of Jesus in his ministry as the Son of Man comes. And this was a direct threat to what the rabbinical order of the day had. They were used to being the authority of God for the people, for the Jewish people. So what does this Son of Man title signify? Why would the Sanhedrin condemn someone who claimed this title for himself? Well, it says in Daniel's vision, the Son of Man would have dominion over all nations, all peoples. And his kingdom is eternal, granted to him by God himself. This would, in effect, do away with the Sanhedrin. And the Jewish leadership would no longer be needed. They would no longer be in power. They could no longer control the people. Think about that. See, the Son of Man would rule over everything and all peoples, all nations, not just the Jews. Not just the Jews of the day. But more importantly, that his reign then would be eternal. Power for eternity. See, they simply wouldn't be needed any longer. This posed a very large threat to the way of life they had come to know a very lavish lifestyle as we've kind of had glimpses at. And that lifestyle came at the expense of their own people. Here the people were under the subjugation of the Romans and they thought the taxes of the Romans were bad. But see, they were being fleeced of everything they had by the very high priests, the rabbinical lord of the day, the ones who supposedly were representing God. They were God's representatives to the Jewish people. But it kept them in a very, very, very lavish lifestyle. In this episode, we see Shmuel at the Sanhedrin. And, and as they take the vote, in all his scheming and wanting for power, that vote was taken. And instead of having a law passed that would have done away with Jesus, an edict instead was passed. And political ramifications were put into place. But it was only then that he found himself as nothing more in a pawn in a political game. It didn't do what he wanted it to have done. It didn't have the effect that he was dreaming about. See, he was really no further ahead than when he'd started to his dismay. Now understand, this again is an artistic license, but it shows that really things have not changed in the last 2,000 years. Struggles for power and control, using others to try and get your way. Sounds all too familiar, doesn't it? Jesus shows us that none of this actually matters. None of it actually matters. Positions, favor, power are all things of the world and have no real place in the kingdom of God, in the ministry of Jesus Christ. It was a lesson the disciples and the apostles had to learn even for themselves in that. See, they saw it and they lived amongst this all the time. 
And they had to see that none of this had any place in the ministry of Jesus. They had to change their mindset from the way they had grown up to see things and understand the way things had worked. It all's changing. It all's changing. We need to know in our journey as disciples, we will run across many challenges and we will run across people who will want to discredit us and our beliefs. And this is when we need to have a good understanding of the Bible, that it is the inspired word of God. I had that happen this last week. I posted up a Bible verse, and the guy that I went to school with years ago, we went to school, sorry, not just me, he fires back a message to me, you are not the house of the Jews. So then I just went ahead and started posting scripture. That tells us, yes, we were. Yes, we are adopted into that. But see, somebody is always going to be out there waiting to slip in something to try and derail you, to try and discredit it. You have to be prepared. You have to know your scriptures. You have to know things that will say, no, we're going to set everybody else who is watching on the street track. So we need to have that good understanding of our mission with Jesus Christ in our lives in order to get where we need to be, in order to be able to put up the defenses for the attacks that will come our way. And they will, and they do. We can't get there passively. We need to be actively engaged, participants in every aspect of the church and its mission. See, being passive will not get God's work done. It will not fulfill your destiny that God has for you. The plan that God has for your life and ultimately may determine how and where you spend eternity. Your actions have eternal consequences. We see that more now in, in today in the society and everything that's going on in the world. Everyone has a choice to make. Eternity has one of two destinations, and we have to make a choice. The choices we make will have eternal consequences. That's the reality of it. So I have a question for you today. Are you truly answering the call of God in your life, or are you passively going through the motions? The choice is now. The time is now. You need to choose wisely. Let us pray. Lord God, come into our hearts today, come into our minds today, and rule over all of the thoughts that would distract us and keep us away from you, to keep us from fulfilling that mission that you have in our hearts, that mission that you have for our lives. Lord, don't let us get sidetracked by all of the noise and the junk of the world today, but help us to concentrate on you, Help us to concentrate on what you would have us do. Put away the things of life. Put away the things of the world that don't matter. There's a lot of junk and noise that are out there created to distract us from what you need us to do, what you want us to do, what we have to do for our lives. And those things have eternal Lord, we ask today that you would fill our hearts with your words, with your deeds, so that we might live them out each and every day. Help us to take this and being a living example of you, representing you, representing Christ to this world. Help us to be your hands and feet, to do your work and your will in our lives today. Lord, cleanse us and make us whole. Fill us today full of your spirit. Guard us from the world and the distractions of the world. We pray these things in your precious Son, Jesus' name. Amen.
as the scripture on the screen says from Luke 22, 19. He took some bread and gave thanks to it, God for it, and then he broke it into pieces. And he gave it to the disciples, saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Scripture goes on to tell us as he picks up the cup and he fills it at the end of the meal. Says, This is the blood of the new covenant. My blood shed for the sins of many. Take and drink. <clears throat> Scripture also tells us that each time that we do this, we have to do so until Christ's return. And as our world gets worse and worse, or seemingly worse and worse, but we can go back in history and see that nothing new under the sun, as Ecclesiastes says, it's nothing new under the sun. But we have hope. Body of Christ, broken for you. Take it. The blood of Christ shed for you. Take it. Father God, as we meditate and think about what this meal represents, Jesus continued to serve us. Your son continued to serve us, even though knowing he was going to the cross. He washed the feet of the disciples. And even though knowing he was going to the cross at the hand of Judas, he still shared this same meal with him. Father, thank you for pursuing us even when we turn away. Thank you for always being there and giving us that hope through your love, mercy, and forgiveness. In Jesus' name. Now it's time for prayers for the people, and I've got several requests. Is there any others before we get started? Or? Okay, let's go to God in prayer and let the Holy Spirit be among me, on me, and among us. Father God, we come to you this morning with praise and honor to the Most High God. You have written your words in our hearts that we might spread your word to others. Ask it as it says in 2 Corinthians 3, 2 through 4. You yourselves are our letters written on our hearts, known and read by everybody. You show that you are a letter from Christ, the result of our ministry written, not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God. Not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of the human hearts. Such confidence as this is ours through Christ before God. And with this confidence, we can bring our request to you each and every day through the power of prayer, asking in the holy name of Jesus that you hear our prayers and they may be answered according to your will. Let us not worry about what others may think of us, but let us live and serve you alone, Father God. Today we're going to ask for prayers for Richard's fam Richards Richardson's family, passing of Mike Richardson, Father God, I just pray for this family. I lift them up to you. I lift them up for comfort and healing for whatever family issues they have. And I pray that you will be with them through this time. And I pray for um, prayer requests for Monica. Her friend Philip is very sick. Her daughter Mary can hardly walk. Prayers for her son Matt. And pray for son to get the help he needs and to find a job. So Father God, I lift up these requests to you this morning. You know exactly their needs, Lord Jesus. You know every part of their body and they, their hearts, you know their hearts and their minds. So be with them, help them get the needs done that they need, help them to get help. Um, just be with them and comfort them in their trials, Lord God, and walk with them through their trials, Lord Jesus. Get Matt the job he needs to help him and heal the sick, Lord God. 
We come before you, Father God, and we lift up Joe for the healing of his knees that he has had surgery on. We ask that the mobility be restored and that every muscle, ligament, tendon, and nerve be healed in Jesus' name. I also ask for rest for him and his wife, Lord God. I ask for sleep, precious sleep that you give to each and every one of us every night so that we can be renewed and restored day by day. We lift up Diane, uh, Lori's mom, for the healing of her foot after surgery, and we ask for comfort and pain relief, Lord, and healing in Jesus' name. We ask that you walk with uh, daily with Amanda and Kelly. Give them courage, confidence, and comfort and love, and healing and strength for each new day that they face this trial that they are in. For all those online and here today that need healing from an illness or surgery, we thank you, Father God, for their lives. And we ask you to restore them back to health in the mighty name of Jesus. Let your will be done in our lives, Lord God. Father, we pray for the homeless, for the shelters to be opened, to provide a place to go from this weather, for food and health or whatever healing is needed from addictions or fear. Put your armor upon them and guide them through this time in their lives to place them to a place where they can call home. We ask you, Father God, to always walk with our children and grandchildren, to guide them through their lives, to help them find you in it daily. Now, Father God, we ask for continued prayers for everyone from is for Israel, to stand in the gap for those chosen people. Father, you know the needs of the Israeli people as they go to war against Hamas, for daily nourishment, courage, wisdom, knowledge as they proceed in this war. I pray for the captives that they would be released. Uh, protect the Jewish people in America from the evil ones in America and this world. Let your will be done, Father God. Hide the Israelis under your wings of protection. In the name of Jesus, Father of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, we honor and praise you today. This concludes our honor portion of the service today, and I invite you to please click on the links for the music that we're going to be listening to here shortly and uh, follow through because there is a very, very definite message in music this week, and uh, I would love to make sure that uh, uh, you are touched by that as well. So receive this benediction today as we close out the service. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. May the God of hope fill you with joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with the hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. And Lord, as we go into this world today, empower us and bold us, ordain us and anoint us to go out and be your representatives, to represent you to the world that is so broken right now. We ask that you would go in peace with grace, love, and mercy. In the name of Jesus.